morning. I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. As part of our ongoing guest series on financial repression, I have Stuart Taylor joining us this morning. Stuart is Vice President of Eaton Vance and a Senior Fixed Income Trader. Welcome, Stuart. Good morning, Gordon. Stuart, it's great to have you with us this morning. I wonder if you could give our listeners a brief overview of your background and of Eaton Vance. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a bond guy. I've been trading uh, fixed income. And actually, yeah, I'm no longer the senior trader. I'm now a portfolio manager and have been for a while. So I probably need to get that straightened up on the uh, 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 Camp Co Talk uh, thing where, where I met, uh, met you guys. But, uh, yeah, so I'm a portfolio manager at Eaton Vance. We're uh, a mutual fund. We manage uh, about $300 billion in assets. Uh, in particular, I'm a... Uh, portfolio manager in the diversified income group. So we manage everything from uh, domestic fixed income, investment grade, all the way out to uh, uh, go anywhere fund we manage that invest globally in corporate debt and equity, those kinds of things. So uh, my specialty is fixed income, but to be a good strategist, PM, uh, you know, I've got kind of a go anywhere mentality, actually. So I watch everything from commodities to credit spreads to, uh, you know, I, I particularly manage our short duration inflation protecting uh, protection fund. And uh, anyway, so yeah, I've been doing this uh, 32 years now, and I'm one of those old dogs getting ready for retirement. So, it, To us, Stuart, it seems that uh, a clear understanding of the macro and having a globally diversified international portfolio is, is mandatory nowadays. I wonder if you could uh, we could start with your definition, your understanding of what the term financial repression means. Uh, sure. I mean, I, I doubt that my take on it is much different than anyone else's. I Personally, I, you know, I, seeing rates at below zero, real rates below zero, as a matter of fact, um, you know, I think the Fed should have raised rates a long time ago. Um, I, you know, I have this view, and I'm not sure it's a popular view in the financial industry, that you know, the Fed basically has subsidized banks at the expense of savers. And uh, you know, I, I also think there's a lot of danger in the world. I mean, rates are at generational lows. Uh, equities are uh, at multi-year peaks. You know, uh, credit spreads are... You know, at one point this year, I think we were down to about 80 OAS on the Lehman Ag. Um, you know, so I don't know. I, I've always been a believer that to do well, you have to buy things that are out of favor. I think the flow of liquidity over the last five years has put literally everything in, in favor. So then how do you hang out without losing uh too much of your principal value, either to even a modest level of inflation, you know, or or by investing in things with less risk, and it's it's a very difficult thing to do. And, you know, I, you know, I'm I'm an older guy. I'm 60 years old, almost 61, and I'll be retiring in another four or five years. And I'm I'm a lot more concerned with keeping what I have than than really. Uh, you know, anything else. And, and it's an ongoing problem, even for someone like me that I think understands markets pretty well. Many of our listeners uh, share the same feelings as you, that we've robbed the savers and pensioners uh, to save the banks. And uh, and many of these people are, are really paying the price today on money they thought was sufficient for retirement that just doesn't earn the income that they had expected or would hope for. And, you know, Greenspan, when he was chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan used to say the job of the central bank is to take away the punch, par punch bowl when the party gets going. And clearly that's something that uh, has, uh, is not done anymore. Comments on what had happened last week with the FOMC meeting. What does it mean to you? Well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty certain the Fed is going to move simply because they you know, I, I know a lot of those guys. They're not they're not dummies. I mean, they understand they have to get away from the zero bound. But you know, first of all, I think they've been over communicating. You know, there's nothing wrong with having a surprise from time to time in markets. It helps provide at least some degree of discipline. But but I think 
you know, as I thought more and more about this, I, I think it sends a terrible message when Fed funds, you know, the real Fed funds rate is 100, negative 100 basis points. So if you raise rates 25 basis points, you're not really tightening. You're just becoming less accommodative, basically. And I think, I think when the markets look at what the Fed said, they decided, look, hey, you know, I, I don't think the Fed has much confidence in the economy right now. And you know, I, I think it just created more confusion, frankly. I, you know, they missed a chance in 2013 during the taper tantrum to go ahead and raise rates. I mean, uh, they had a free shot at it, and they didn't do it. I think they had a free shot at it again this last month. They didn't take it, and now it becomes it becomes harder as we go along, particularly uh, given what we're seeing happening in emerging markets, uh, China to some degree. And, you know, of course, I, you know, I, I monitor something. I call them, well, I don't call them. They're, they're the surprise indexes, you know. And you can see them through Bloomy or uh, Citibank. Uh, several people do these things. And uh, what I've seen over the last three to four weeks is the surprise index rolling over again, which means the economy is growing less than, economist expectations, right? And it's a very sickly kind of thing. The economy weakens, everyone lowers their expectations, and then the economy strengthens, and the surprise index turns positive again. But point being, there's a pretty strong correlation between rates and the surprise index, you know, what the economy is going to do. And I think the Fed's going to be in a situation where actually conditions are maybe modestly worse in November and December. So... They should have gone ahead, I think. But, hell, I'm wrong a lot, Gordon. So, With FOMC and the Fed is always a great game of speculation for everybody. What we're seeing, Stuart, is a, is a serious slowdown around the world. Um, in all of the countries that uh, we talk to, players there, um, specifically in the emerging markets, specifically those that are commodities-oriented as a, in their export and uh, these, the FOMC meeting really, well, what we've seen is the dollar weakened since it, since that meeting, which has helped the emerging markets or should help the emerging markets. Uh, what's your views on the dollar before we talk bonds? Well, I think the dollar probably has done most of what is it. It depends. Are you talking about trade weighted dollar or, you know, the dollar index? A uh, trade weighted dollar probably has a bit more upside left in it. Dollar index. You know, I, you know, it's a very, very crowded trade to be long dollars right now. So, and particularly if, you know, the U.S. economy begins to weaken somewhat and the Fed has to uh, put off uh, raising rates for a while, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of just, you know, straight long dollar positions. You know, I do want to go back and, and make one comment. You know, you, you mentioned emerging markets and commodities in particular, and, I, you know, that, I've always been a big believer. I'm, I'm a bit of a contrarian. I mean, the way you produce returns for your clients is you find sectors that are very, very much out of favor. And uh, a commodity certainly fits that bill right now, both in terms of its momentum. You know, think about it. Commodities began moving lower almost three years ago. And it's been almost a, uh, there have been a couple of interruptions in the trend, but Generally speaking, commodities, uh, uh, several of the EMs that are, you know, explicitly tied to commodity prices, some of the materials names, things of that nature, they've been in a bear market. I think you're supposed to be trying to figure out uh, when and how to be long those sectors. The other thing I think it points out, though, is commodities have been going down for three years, and yet equities have continued rallying or at least stayed in that long trading range over the last year, right? So, I, you know, I think it's evidence that perhaps equities have become uh, somewhat uh, divorced from the real economy. I certainly think commodities are much more indicative of the real commodity than equities are. So it tells you either commodities have to go up, equities have to come down, or some combination of the two. But... Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking for ways to own commodities now. And uh, I know that's contrarian, but it's something I kind of like. It seems that the big money is always made when everybody's on the same side of a, of, a, of a trade consistently. We may be looking at a consolidation here, certainly in the commodities. Our charts are suggesting that. 
uh, maybe even a dead cat bounce in some of them. But uh, what are your views since the FOMC on what's happened with spreads and the investment grade, high yield and treasuries? Any signals that you've spotted, Stuart? I, I wouldn't call them signals, just continuation. I mean, high yield started um, the OAS, the high yield index, and uh, uh, spread to treasuries began widening soon after the completion of QE3. Uh, and that trend's continuing. Um, you know, and I think the worrisome thing is that you know, we've seen in the past, particularly over the last seven or eight years, that the uh, credit spreads tend to lead equities. You know, they haven't really, equities have not followed credit spreads wider yet. I think that may be on the verge of happening. So I've just seen a continuation. You've also got to uh, look under the hood in terms of, Credit spreads, um, you know, different sectors are, you know, particularly, again, high-yield energy, commodities, even in investment grade, you know, uh, industrials to some degree, they've been beat up much more so than, than other sectors. So, We're seeing some fairly clear indications that consumer confidence, investor sentiment is starting to shift globally and certainly in specific countries. Do you see a shift come, an abrupt shift coming possibly in the bond market? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I do. I, I think the one thing that happens with rates, though, that, that not many people appreciate is, that first of all, there's, there's a difference in how rates believe in, uh, behave in an inflationary environment and how they behave in a deflationary environment. Uh, in a deflationary environment, the main driver of rates really is flight to quality, right? So equities go down, bonds go up as people hide from, from badness in other parts of the world, right? Um, I think that's the big driver right now. So if equities go ahead and break down, I suspect you'll see rates fall again. Uh, if, on the other hand, they stabilize, you know, I've been I've been fairly bearish of rates now since January after being bullish for you know all of 2014 basically, um, but I may be on the verge if equities weaken anymore of needing to flatten that trade out because in a in an environment where equities are sick, rates are going to at least hold in there. I would think. Um, yeah, is there can there be an abrupt change? Yeah, I, I think so, and at some point it's going to happen. But if you look historically, uh, you see that these these changes, trend changes in, in terms of bond yields take sometimes a full decade to complete. You know, the uh, 30 years set its low in 2012. So, you know, we're, we're only three, four years into what typically is at least a six, seven, eight-year kind of, kind of process. Putting on your macro hat, looking around the world for possible major shifts, uh, what's your biggest concern? China, Japan, um, emerging markets, the EU? Yeah, you know, first of all, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in this idea that too much debt pushes down on, on economic uh, uh, growth. Right, and and so I think we're in a world that's kind of constrained by debt, and that's not going to change anytime soon. EU looks kind of okay. We look kind of okay. China, I think, is you know some of the some of the series I keep that I, I don't think it's as pessimistic there probably as the market seems to be pricing in. I don't really view their equity market as. Uh, particularly just kind of like ours, right? But, but, you know, multiplied, I mean, to an even greater degree, their equity market isn't particularly well connected to the underlying economy. So I, I kind of dismiss what equities are doing on the way up or the way down as a signal. But uh, when I do look at things like electricity usage, you know, car registrations, things like that, some of the anecdotal things, uh, uh, you know, conversations I have with people that do surveys and, and such. I, you know, I, I think there's probably still reasonable growth there. It's, it's not nearly as bad as, you know, and that's, I think, too, one of the reasons to think that maybe commodities are someplace close to a bottom. 
Where I'm most concerned, obviously, is just commodities not turning in time and the EM continue, just continuing. I mean, you look at countries like Brazil that are being rocked by, um, you know, just graft and corruption kind of things. Uh, that's hugely concerning given, given how large a role in EM countries like Brazil. And, and, and it's not the only example, you know, all, it's pretty funny, you know, the, the BRICS, uh, all with the exception of India, you know, have, have really had a rough time of late, and I don't really see that changing anytime soon. So, yeah. Stuart, can you uh, speak to the elements of creating a bond portfolio in an era of an inflationary environment, which uh, many expect to see coming? Two or three things. I, since bonds are kind of where I where I live and breathe, um, uh, the first thing is I, I think just the mathematics of owning a long treasury, the risk reward associated with it. Um, the, the math isn't particularly compelling. I mean, you, you always like to be in a trade or an investment with a greater reward than potential risk, right? You think about a 10 year treasury, let's just call it 2% right now. That two, uh, that 10 year treasury has a duration, which is a measure of interest rate risk of roughly 10. Right, 10 years. So what that means is for every 100 basis points that rates change, the value of that security is going to change 1%. Well, I mean, we have two years at two, a 4%, and you only have roughly a 2% coupon. If rates over the next three years somehow move back to 4%, that's a 20% principal loss, Right versus only a 2% annual income, um, that's not a good risk-reward, right? Um, and, and that is really scaring a lot of people who push the yeah. numbers. So, so I think, I think there, you know, in terms of just your fixed income portfolio, putting the inflation aspect aside, you know, I, I like, the, you know, I don't mind taking a bit of credit risk. I, you know, I do think that, Domestic corporations are in relatively good shape, at least good enough shape to weather, you know, what I think is might happen over the next few years. But you can build, for instance, a one to five year A rated laddered portfolio, right? Current yield is uh, maybe 170 or so. The duration of roughly two and a half years, so you don't have a lot of rate risk. But what happens if rates start going up, obviously the first lot wrong will mature in a year. You'll reinvest that at the higher rate and so on and so, so forth. And, uh, you know, if you do the math on these uh, ladders, you figure out, you know, rising rates is actually a good thing at the end of the day for the well, you know, uh, uh, well-structured ladders. So, okay, I like the concept of short ladders using credit, um, you know, you can do the same thing using treasuries. The yield will be, probably be, you know, more like one, one and a quarter, something like that, I suspect. Um, and that gives you some protection. One of the things, of course, people do for protection from inflation is buy tips. Unfortunately, most tips, uh, well, you know, tips are bonds, right? And the first thing that typically happens when, uh, you have a whiff of inflation or a burst of inflation as rates move higher. So if you're investing in an intermediate to long-term tip, rates go up, the price of that tip is going to go down, and it's probably going to go down much more than the inflation accrual that it achieves. So if you're going to invest in a tips, uh, you want to keep, you know, so so all tips get exactly the same inflation accrual. It doesn't matter if they're one year to maturity or thirty years to maturity. They get exactly the same uh, inflation. So investing in a long term tip and taking a lot of uh, rate risk at the same time, you know, for me that's a non starter. And, and I'm sure many of your clients have tips that are five years or longer to maturity. You know, they need to shorten those maturities down, take a bit less yield, and um, avoid the rate risk. Now, I do think that inflation assets right now 
are extremely inexpensive. I mean, um, I look at inflation. You know, it's, there there are a lot of moving parts to inflation, but CPI. You have services inflation. You have goods inflation. If you look at services inflation, it's still running two and a quarter, two thirty, something like that, year over year. On the other hand, goods inflation, because of what ha- what has happened in the oil market, is is essentially unchanged year over year. But declines in energy feed into headline very very quickly, so you have a new base from which inflation is now figured. Any kind of upward, uh, you know, even just sideways movement in uh, energy now becomes additive to overall inflation. So you've got services at 230. You now have uh, uh, goods inflation is, is basically about as low as it can get, I think, near its low. And anything as you start adding on, that's going to be additive to the 230, basically, right? So I think, I think inflation is bottoming as we speak. And you know, these assets right now are priced well below the long-term trend of inflation. Um, you know, long-term trend of inflation is a little bit over 2%, 2.5%. And, uh, gosh, you can buy a two-year tips break even right now. Let me look and see where we are this morning. Yeah, two-year tips break even right now is like 24 basis points. That's, that's cheap. Stuart, any uh, closing comments you'd like to make for our investors out there? Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm really worried about equities at this point. Um, you know, that, that, that's the thing I'm, I'm watching most closely. I, you know, if equities can, you know, hold these lows from a few weeks ago and begin moving sideways again, you know, then rates can go ahead and move up. But that's the key to me. You start breaking equities down, rates are going to fall. And you know, I think it's it's. You know, people aren't going to sell what's their best performing assets. They're going to sell their worst performing assets. So, you know, I would think that that would put a lot of pressure on things like EM commodities, things of that nature. But you know, I think it would open up a pretty good buying opportunity. You know, in the longer run. So, yeah, that's it. Watching the equity markets like a hawk, just because I know that that's going to feed into so many other markets. Stuart, could you tell our listeners how they could uh, follow your writings and learn more about uh, the products at Eaton Vance? Oh, sure. Well, Eaton Vance has a uh, terrific uh, website. Uh, you know, my particular fund is the Short Duration Real Return Fund, and uh, uh, there's also a blog where they post managers' comments, and you'll see my comments there regarding Fed, inflation, rates, things of that nature, but also managers from all through the Eaton Vance complex. Um, you know, and I'm on Bloomberg, you know, once every few weeks and this and that in the journal in various places. So um, I'm not one of those big names, but, you know, I, I kind of get around, man. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, that's why we called you. 2016 is going to be an interesting year. Uh, Lots to talk about there, and we'll have to have you back. Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having me. See you. 